Oh, hey there, I didn't hear you guys come in. Welcome to another episode of The Model Guy, as I change things up a little bit this episode and take on another tank. This time I'll be building to me as 135 Elephant Tank Destroyer, which has quite the colorful history that we'll get into. And if you know this channel, I generally build aircraft, and I've only done a few tanks, but I was very excited to kind of push the envelope on this one. I'm going to be following a lot of the techniques laid out by Night Shift, by adding some cast texture, sanding that down, replacing welds, but rather than tell you, how about I show you? Because I'm using a photo etch set for this kit, I had to remove a lot of the mounting tabs for the kit fenders and other accessories. So those were the first to go before the cast texture. And the whole point of this is when you're rolling a thick steel, there is a little bit of texture to it. Now, the Tamiya kit doesn't show it too well, so I decided to add it in. And I had a few people tell me that this was over-exaggerated by laying down putty, but I think once I lay down paint, oils, weathering, and start beating it up a little bit, that'll greatly push it back and it'll sort of all tie together. Once the texturing was done, I decided to enhance the flame cut marks on the steel by using a knife. If you've ever cut thick steel with an acetylene torch, you actually know there's a nice pattern of parallel lines that are slightly slanted as you continue the cut. With everything drying on the model so far, it was time to bend up the fenders just to get an idea of where they were going to sit, because there was going to be a lot of mock-up with this and removal before things could really progress. I didn't want to shoot myself in the foot by putting anything in way of mounting the fenders. The next step was to remove the pistol ports, because the Voyager photo etch set I bought actually has some turned covers for this, and they look quite a bit nicer than the kit's detail. And really, they're a simple install. You cut, drill, plop them in. I also decided to go as far as installing the bolt heads for all of the hinges on the kit. And to be honest, when I first bought this kit two years ago, it scared me because I also picked up the photo etch for it, and the metal tracks, and the metal barrel. And not being somebody that does armor, and then having all this additional detail to put on top of it, I was actually scared of the kit and it sat untouched. And then finally one day I said, I'm just going to go for it. If I start having trouble, I'll just put it back in the box. And it was actually quite the fun build. By using the Voyager brass hinges and some rod, I was actually able to make all of the hinges on the kit functional. So while the fenders flipped up, the hatches could flip up. And after all that work, I ended up closing most of the hatches because I made a little bit of a mistake of not painting the interior black, so everything was visible. But that's okay, we'll get into how I fix that later. The Voyager set also includes the traveling lock for the gun barrel. And this just took a little bit of time as I marked on the kit barrel where the lock would sit. Then I heated up the brass and wrapped it around the kit's styrene barrel. That way I wouldn't damage the metal one. And once I had the curve set, everything went together quite well. One trick to bending and rounding brass is to heat it up first. That definitely makes this metal more malleable. For mounting all that brass to the kit plastic, I used AK's Black Widow Super Glue just because it was black and it's easy to remove because it's very visible. You just need some debonder. One pro tip is if you're going to make the travel lock movable, take it off before you go to paint because you're probably going to knock it off the kit. Ask me how I know. With the travel lock now in place, I moved back to the fenders and inserted some brass rod into the bolt holes and then included the Voyager springs to keep everything in place. And the kit parts couldn't match this level of detail. And I think I only paid 20 bucks for the Voyager stuff. So in hindsight, that was a great investment because it brought a lot more character to the model. Voyager also includes all the hardware you need to mount the spare tracks on the front of the tank. I temporarily mounted the ones from the kit just so I could mark the areas where the styrene would mount and drill the holes for the rods. And yes, Voyager also includes the bolt heads in brass so you can install those on top of the brackets that hold the spare links in place. I just had to open those up a little bit with a drill bit and they dropped right on and then were secured with super glue. Now that most of the brass work was done, it was time to move on to the putty. And for doing the welds, I used Tamiya's epoxy putty and made some tools out of a Pepsi can and some toothpicks. And by simply wetting them and then tapping them, I would come in and leave a welding pattern on the tank. I did this on my Sturm Tiger and my Sherman a couple years ago, and I found it definitely made the tank look heavier and it was worth doing. It's also very relaxing, like some type of monk sand garden thing with rocks if you've ever seen that. The Tamiya putty gives you quite a bit of working time as well, so if you're not happy with the weld, you can come in and keep adjusting it until you have a pattern that you like. 
You may be asking yourself right now why I'm still missing plates on the front of the tank that haven't been installed yet. And the simple answer for that is to make applying the Zimmerit that much easier. The tools I have from Trumpeter are great, they leave a nice pattern, but they're very difficult to get into tight areas. And even making my own tools with sharpened sprue to look like a slotted screwdriver, it doesn't really get in there tight enough to leave a nice clean Zimmerit. So I ended up leaving those off so I could do it away from the tank and then install them afterwards. And this was the biggest hang up I think I had with this kit and I kind of got in my own mind. I was afraid that the Zimmerit going around the bolts on the front of the tank would be a challenge and I wouldn't know how to do it and would end up screwing it up. I also didn't want to use the Tamiya Zimmerit because it was too perfect. I wanted the Zimmerit to be kind of nasty looking knowing that this was applied by hand. After doing a bit more research though on the Elephant, I actually found out that the bolts on the side of the tank didn't have the Zimmerit pattern around them in that circular pattern. They were just laid up and then the, whoever applied them just simply stopped at the bolts and said nuts to this. Two big tips when applying the Zimmerit is one, keep your tools damp, not soaking so the putty doesn't stick like I'm showing here, and try to roll the putty on as thin as you can. The thinner you do it, the better the Zimmerit looks in my opinion. It turns out that there's a couple of German tank fans out there who weren't happy with my Zimmerit and actually messaged me and posted comments on my Instagram and Facebook saying that the elephants didn't get this beat up and the Zimmerit was looked perfect right through to the end of the war. And if you follow me on this channel, you know that I love weathering and find that it adds character to the models. And I had a hard time believing that because when I looked at Zimmerit applied to other tanks like the Tiger and the Panther, it was chipped and falling off in sheets. Having done some research on that, the Zimmer was applied pretty much the same way. It was a mix of concrete and hay, and then applied to the tank on top of a primer, and then baked on. And usually within a few weeks, it would start chipping off. Now for the moment of truth. When it came to laying down the Zimmer pattern around the hatches and the bolts, I pretty much psyched myself up for nothing, because by applying just the last couple teeth on the trumpeter tool, I was able to really control it and where the pattern was going down. And I left this section pretty much unedited just to see that I did it at a slower pace, took my time, and it came out pretty okay in my opinion. To talk about the history of the elephant, you actually have to talk about the vehicle it was derived from. And no, we're not talking about the Ferdinand because that was the second vehicle it was derived from. We're going to talk about the initial Tiger prototype that was designed by Porsche. Yes, Porsche, the same company that puts the engines in the back of sports cars for men in their 50s going through middle life crisis. So what happened was Porsche put together a heavy tank proposal for the German army and basically said, this is what we want. We have diesel engines powering generators. On paper, it looked like it would be a good fit and it would win. And Porsche made the mistake of making something like 90 hulls before the German army decided after the Porsche caught fire and testing that, no, we're going to go with the other group and we're, you're not going to get the contract. Now, Porsche wasn't going to let that deter them because they ended up deciding to turn it into a tank destroyer. And this laid the grounds for other tank destroyers like the Yag Panther, but that's a different story. So what did Porsche do when their hulls weren't going to grow up to be heavy tanks for the German army? Well, what they did was they added caissons on top of them with 200 millimeters of frontal armor, slapped in an 88 millimeter gun, moved the crew compartments around a little bit, moved the diesel engines forward to power the generators for the electric drive, and they had a tank destroyer, and they sent it off to Kursk with the Panthers and Tigers as part of the German super weapons to help win the war. But when you know about Kursk, these things kind of failed miserably. Even though that 88mm gun was arguably one of the best guns of the war and devastating against the Soviet armor, there is one problem the Germans never really thought of or solved on the Eastern Front, and that was if they didn't own the battle space, they couldn't remove their damaged tanks to repair them. So when tanks like the Tiger and Panther and Ferdinand, which this was now called, broke down, they couldn't bring them back to repair them, so the crews had to blow them in place, which resulted in unnecessary losses. Cough, cough, something in other countries learning right now in the Ukraine, but that's also a different story. One major flaw of the Ferdinand, and no, it wasn't the low mileage with the diesel electric engines that would make Greta cry, it was the fact that the tank had no means of protecting itself against infantry. Where most tanks would sport a bow gun or a gun up on the commander's cupola, the Ferdinand had nothing. If the infantry got up on top of that thing, 
they were pretty much done. So after Kursk, any surviving Ferdinands went back to the factory for an overhaul to bring them up to combat status. A machine gun was added to the bow, and a commander's cupola was updated, and then they renamed it from the Ferdinand to the Elephant. Some were then shipped to Italy to fight against the Allies, and the rest went back to the Eastern Front. But unfortunately, like the German tanks at the time, it was pretty heavy and had trouble crossing bridges, and it was pretty limited in mobility. Like many of the German tanks at the time, it was designed for an offensive role, but the German army at the time was on the retreat, so it never saw its full potential. Only one elephant survived the war, and that was brought back to the United States and is on display at the United States Army Ordnance Training Facility, and you can actually see that overhauled on t the show Tank Overhaul. The second survivor is actually a Ferdinand, which was captured by the Soviets at Kursk and is on display at the Kabinka Tank Museum. Back to the build, I don't think I want to use Frule tracks again. There was a lot of cleanup here, and although it wasn't too bad, when you have 226 links you have to clean up, it can get pretty tiresome. Just put on a movie, get your favorite chisel, a tungsten drill bit, and be ready to spend some time cleaning this all up. One cool thing I have learned about metal tracks though is once they're on the tank, you can actually load them up and then back them off to get the right sag. Okay, I'm playing with it. I'm not going to lie. I was just playing with it. Sorry. One area that had to be addressed on the model was the commander's cupola and the vision ports for the driver. There was no detail on the kit, so I had about two hours in Fusion 360. I designed some replacements, printed them off, and then cleaned them up to go on the tank. I tried using a loner cupola from my Sturmgeschutz, which is what the Germans did when upgrading the Ferdinand to the Elephant. But unfortunately, because it was a different brand, the measurements were off, and it was just easier to design it and print it myself. And I saved myself about 40 bucks from buying a resin replacement. When painting this beast, I wanted to use the same approach I do for aircraft models, and that's to lay down some different tones underneath, some dark browns, whites, and any other color I think will affect the final blend coat, even some rot brown, anything that'll change the final tone. And the whole point here is to give the paint some depth and not just be a straight dunkelgelb. Now I know there's different methods to this, especially when it comes to modulation and things like that. I'm not a big fan of it, but you'll notice on this build, I did add a little bit of lighter tones to the top of the tank. And in the end, it wasn't really noticeable, so I'm not sure if it's something I'll do again. But if I maybe if I do do it again, maybe I'll dial it up to 11 and really go to town to see how it looks. But I really wanted this to look battered because I was basing it on a photograph of the last elephant in Zosin in 1945. This tank was pretty beat up and the photo it looks kind of pathetic really because it's sitting in the middle of the town destroyed. And I thought, what a great inspiration for a build. It allows me to have a lot of weathering, a lot of wear and tear. And the photo is actually quite blurry too, so you can have a lot of artistic freedom. So if you're a big fan of German tanks and didn't think they got that beat up, I apologize to you now because you're not going to like this. When using the AK Real Colors paint for this tank, I found that out of the bottle they were way too vibrant. And I decided to cut them quite a bit because I wanted a washed out look. So I ended up using about a 50% mix of buff with the green, the rot brown, and the dunkel gelb, just so it stayed in the same family and the colors didn't shift too much. For the green and the rot brown on the tank, I used my Mr. Hobby PS270 and I dropped my PSI down to about 10 PSI. And then I added quite a bit more thinner than usual to the paint. And this basically gave me a lot of control to slowly build up the color this type of camouflage was generally done by maintenance crews in the field and I didn't want it to look perfect and I wanted it to look in scale. So a lot of these blotches are just built up using small squiggles because you have to keep the scale of the person in mind. They're not going to be able to reach across the entire length of the tank when doing the blotch. They're going to have to move around on a ladder, they're going to have to change their position and there's going to be a lot of inconsistencies in the paint. And those are the little details I like to add in. I considered using masking putty to mask off these blotches, but in the end it was actually faster to just to use the brush freehand. What's really going to set off the purists with this camouflage is it may be fictional. The picture I have from Zosin, the camouflage laid on the tank, doesn't match other photos I have of elephants or Ferdinands, and 
<laughs> when I was checking through the internet, the closest camouflage I could find was the elephant from the game War Thunder. The blotches made sense. They looked like they were about in the right area, so I went with it. As if things weren't weird enough with the camouflage, it was now time to start painting the undercoat for the Zimmerit, and I used Vallejo's Calvary Brown for this. There's a definite redness to it, and it just looks like a close match to Red Oxide Primer, and using a brush is a lot more control than trying to mask this all off. Once that was done, it was time to try to bring down the harshness of that paint and how vibrant it was by doing some chipping. And I used two different methods for this. I used some sponge chipping, which is very quick and you just have to be controlled with it that you're not just throwing it everywhere. And then I followed that up with a brush when I wanted to have some bigger chips or I really wanted to emphasize an area that the crew would be moving over or dragging equipment on top of. Before that, sponge even gets near the tank, what I'll do is I'll unload as much paint as I can using either the palette or some paper towel just to make sure it's not going to lay down big fat blotches. I want it to barely leave any marks and that seems to be the perfect zone to be operating in. This is also a very quick method and you can generally lay down a whole chipping session in about an hour to two hours. Once the sponge has done its job, I then come in with a fine pointed brush and start refining the chips, either making them larger or joining a few together and bringing more wear into areas that make sense. Like hatches that have to come off the engine for inspection, or crew hatches, or fenders that are rubbing along brush when the tank's backing into a fighting position, or where a gun cleaning rod may sit up on the deck. I want these chips to tell a story, I don't want them just to be thrown on just for the hell of it. This is one of these effects that is very easy to overdo. To keep things interesting, I also added a few scratches along the side of the tank, just figuring this is where brush would be dragging against or debris when the tank backing into fighting positions or pulling out. The next step was to come in and expose where the chipping would have gone straight through to the steel underneath. And to do that, I bring back the sponge, I use some German gray paint from Vallejo, and follow the exact same procedure as I did with the light Dunkelgelb. And the point here is you want to keep this in the areas that have a lot of traffic. And where I have my bigger paint chips, I'm coming in to add the steel inside of those. And again, this has to be in areas that make sense. You don't want to just throw them everywhere. I really built them up on the areas of the fender where they've been crushed. And again, in areas for inspection hatches that come off or the crew would be climbing across. One thing I did notice that as soon as these steel chips started going down, they really brought everything together and the paint underneath didn't seem as vibrant. And this is what I was talking about earlier when all these layers start adding up. I had a lot of fun painting the Zimmerit on this tank and I think that's because I used quite a few techniques to do it. Once everything had been brushed the Calvary Brown for the primer, it was then time to paint the damaged areas of the Zimmerit and to add some chipping. And the small chips were done by flicking paint onto the surface. And then I refined all the edges with the brush. And this was now the second layer of chipping that was on the Zimmerit. There were a few areas where the Zimmerit hadn't rolled out properly with the tool. And I painted a lot of gray in here just to make it look like that Zimmerit had been pushed or knocked off the tank, but not enough to go down to the primer. With the Zimmerit drying on the side of the tank, it was now time to lay down some panel line washes while I planned my next moves. And the whole point of the panel line wash is to trick your eye into thinking there's a lot of dirt built up into these areas and to highlight details on the tank. I find it best to use colors that aren't as stark as black or white and use browns just to make things less harsh. And the nice thing about using enamels or oils is if you're not happy with it, you can come in with some odorless thinner and clean it up and push it all back and even start again if you have to. To start building up the weathering underneath the tank and along the tracks, I use some Vallejo light mud texture. And this is exactly what it sounds like. It's just a textured paste that you can put on the model and you can also blend it with water afterwards. But the only thing with this acrylic paste is once it's dried, it's pretty much dried and you're not changing it. That's why it's best to test this stuff on the bottom of the tank or in areas that aren't really going to be seen. And one big tip as well is to keep this away from mounting areas for the suspension 
because you may find yourself running into trouble trying to reassemble the drivetrain. One thing I've found with working with this acrylic paste in the past is it likes to absorb oil paints or enamels you put on top of it, so it has to be sealed. And the best way to do this is just to come in with a lacquer paint and spray it down on top. And I mixed up a dusty color to do that before coming in with the oils. It's now time to bring in the last layer onto the Zimmerit, and to do that I'm using some oil paint and I'm going to blend them in just to make it look like there's some residue left over from the Zimmerit. And if you're wondering what Zimmerit is, it's actually an anti-magnetic paste or coating that the Germans put on their tanks because they were afraid that the Russians may put magnetic explosives on the vehicles. The only thing though is that the Germans were the only ones who actually used magnetic mines during the war. So for a period you'll see Zimmerit on German vehicles and then later in the war you'll see they've not bothered to do it anymore. If you're down in the weeds just make sure you have some good references to work from. By using oil paints in really thin layers and using the oil paint rendering technique and a hair dryer, you can really build up this paste and blend it together. Basically what you're doing is adding little dots of oil paint and then coming in with a different brush that's either dry or has a little bit of thinner in it and blending it into the paint by tapping it or pushing it around. And this takes multiple layers to really be effective with. What I wanted to do was to blend in the grays with the red and make it just look like a bit of a mess, which is how these vehicles look. The nice thing about oil paint is if you're not happy with it, it's very easy to remove and start again. I used some AK burnishing fluid on the tracks for this kit and then came in with the Vallejo acrylic mud again and then came in with that same dust mix to tie it in with the tank. And the nice thing about metal tracks is once you have all your paint down, you can show the worn areas just by using a sanding sponge or stick to remove the high points of the track where they would be polished from touching the ground. And just like the bottom gets polished, the top gets polished as well from the road wheels. And if you're not sure how that works, the next time you see a train go by, check out the wheels on the cars. Where they come in contact with the track is highly polished. That's exactly what happens with metal on metal tank tracks. I really wanted this elephant to look like it was worn out, so all these steel chips had a layer of rust oil paint put on top and then blended in. One nice thing about being a heavy equipment mechanic is I'll often look at equipment I'm working on and take photos of rust spots just to see what it looks like and think about how I would best recreate that. Same thing goes for when you're laying down pigments, mud, or dust on a model. When you're climbing into a heavy loader or a grader, you can see where the mud and dirt stays on the equipment, and I use that for a reference as well. So after shoving some pigments into some areas on the tank that made sense, I then locked them down with some AK gravel and sand fixer. And I know some people say this dries to a glossy finish, but I let it dry for a full 24 hours and it looked flat, and I never put a flat coat on this model. Now that the model was nearly complete, I almost forgot to paint those vision ports that I spent so much time designing and printing. And that was pretty much the icing on the cake. It's one of those little details that'll probably never get noticed, but I know it's there. And then on top, I added the last few pieces from the Voyager Photo Etch set. That's going to bring this episode to a close. I just want to take a moment to thank my patrons who support me outside of this channel and invite you to join as well. 132 scale supporters get to see videos one week early ad free and 148 subscribers get to see videos 24 hours in advance ad free. If Patreon's not your thing, that's cool too. Just smash that subscribe button and make sure you set the bell that you get notified when videos upload. As always, leave a comment in the comment section. I try to reply to as many as I can. And just to start some discourse, why don't you write what is a genre you didn't think you would find yourself building, but you have tried? Or what is a genre you want to try, but you may be re hesitant to do? Let me know. The nice thing about changing genres or trying something new is it keeps things fresh and you may actually learn some new techniques from it. I find that by doing these tanks, my oil skills greatly improve and I can bring that back to the aircraft side. So don't be afraid to try new things. This is the Model Guy. I will see you next time.